I would suspect we'll see three or four more rounds of ups and downs. The uh, Trump team is going to Moscow, sorry, to Beijing next, uh, next week for, you know, a hard set of bargaining. And I think uh, my bet is still they'll end up with something that Trump will regard as good enough to declare a temporary victory and will extend the moratorium on increase in tariffs for another, let's say, six months. But the negotiations are going to go on over the whole rest of this term because they're really symptomatic of the deeper mm -hmm. rivalry between the U.S. and China, which is now across the board. So if the markets, uh, people are selling off these great American companies thinking that 10 percent tariffs have already been damaging, 25 percent tariffs would be much more so. You think that's a mistake? Well, I'm not in the business of giving day-by-day -day, uh, financial advice, but I would say yes, to pay too much attention to the trash talk day-by-day -day is, I think, uh, just to be, you know, chasing it this way and chasing it that way. There are a lot of big headwinds for the American economy, and there are a lot of big headwinds for the Chinese economy. And I think if you look at the incentives for both Xi and Trump, the incentives for them finding a way to do an ugly but good enough deal to prevent the increase in the tariffs on March 1st okay. seem to me to be more powerful. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you about some of the longer-term consequences, though, of this, because you had a great piece in the journal recently where you said that it's a Chinese-Russian alliance that most threatens our interests right now. How close is this alliance? Well, most people haven't failed to notice, and I was actually happy since I wrote this a, a month ago, uh, that the uh, National Intelligence uh, uh, assessment that came out this past week basically says the same thing. So if you look at the facts, uh, even though the inherent interests of Russia and China should not be pulling them together, in fact, they, there's emerged a detente, an entente between these two countries that, as the intelligence officer said, is now thicker than anything we've seen, seen since the 1950s. So. In yeah. Washington today, I think too often people almost use Russia and China as if they were, you know, siblings or something. In fact, there's a lot of comple complexities, but this relationship has become quite thick and quite thick because each of them see the U.S. as their principal threat. Yes, and does that then argue for the U.S. actually trying to maintain lines of communication, trade relationships, you know, friendly relations between the, two, the leaders of the U.S. and China and between the leaders of the U.S. and Russia for all of the, the problems with those authoritarian countries. What you're describing would, sounds more dangerous if they float out of our, uh, you know, so, uh, away from the U.S. altogether than if we maintain some kind of back and forth here. You're exa exactly right, and that's very uncomfortable or unpleasant for Americans to think that, oh, my God, there's consequences of the actions we take. But it's a fact that the uh, enemy of my enemy is a friend. And uh, if we make enemies of both parties, uh, we're going to push them together, as we've been doing. Secondly, that just as you said, that in a trilateral geopolitical relationship, as we found in the, you know, with Kissinger and Nixon, when you first had the split between uh, the China and the Soviet Union, you want to be closer to each of the mm -hmm. competitors than either is to each other. So that's a hard challenge. It's often unpleasant. Yeah. It means dealing with authoritarian regimes that we don't like for a lot of other reasons. But if you fail to do that, you can hardly complain that the predictable consequence occurs.